Hi, I'm Yusuf. Hi, I am John McMaster, here in my Silicon Valley ship decapping lab. Yusuf, I hear you've been doing some ship work yourself recently. I have. So, you know, when I've been looking at uh, little silicon images from like Intel and, um, you know, other companies for most of my life, right? And they're very pretty. They have these rainbow colors, a lot of little squiggles. But till very recently, I didn't realize that you can actually reverse engineer those circuits. And I've been wanting you to do this talk for a long time. So, you know, this is going to be great on how we can go in looking at a little silicon image and actually figure out what are the little components in there and how they're connected and, uh, you know, like figure out what the chip's doing. Sure, sounds great. So I think what we can do then is I'm going to bring up a chip image, which I think you've spent a little bit of time looking at. And let's kind of talk back and forth about, you know, what you've been able to discern and maybe I can provide some additional hints for you to get a little bit further in the image. Sound good? Sounds good. Okay, then I'm going to uh, share my screen. Actually, can you see my screen right now? I cannot. Okay, because uh, it seems to have taken away my sharing option. Okay, here we go. Okay, how about now? Yep, I can see it now. Great. So here we have uh, a mystery chip, and I believe you also gave me an annotated version, right? So Yes, I did. So I went in, I read up a couple of tutorials online, and as far as I could figure out, I highlighted some distinct things on the chip. That doesn't mean I actually know what they do, but I, I think that, uh, you know, these were the few components I could uh, recognize. Okay, why don't you walk me through about some of the things you were able to figure out then? So what I think I'm pretty confident about is uh, the one listed as A, which sure. seem to be the locations where the bond wires attach from the silicon to the little connectors on the uh, chip package. That's right. And Gina, what are those wires called? Oh, we did this, the first video. Yes. Are they not bond wires? Ah, uh, yes, bond wires. Yes. Okay. Yes, bond wires, okay. okay. And, and the other thing that I think I'm pretty confident about is all the shiny traces here are kind of equivalent to wires in a circuit. They're just carrying, you know, uh, power around, current around. Sure, I personally think of them like a, a printed circuit board. In some ways, it's just like that. You lay out traces on a circuit board, just like you would on a computer chip. Mm -hmm. um, okay, and you know, the other thing, so if you zoom out a little bit, the one that I highlighted as B, yes, seems to be a transistor. Now, just a slight note here, when I was looking through, you know, some of the tutorials and talks people have given, I realized that transistors aren't don't look like little nice square things because that's what in my head I have. They're listed as, you know, on schematics as these little, you know, square diagrams. They can have long legs. They can have like weird shapes. They can have like little hooky kind of elements in there. So sure. that actually confused me a lot more. Yes. And in fact, I think you may have gotten a little bit unlucky. Unfortunately, you are looking at one of the analog parts of the chip. So I would actually recommend that we skip over B because I think that's a little bit less straightforward and we can come okay. back to that later. So that definitely isn't a transistor. Mm. Let's, let's come back to that. <laughs> okay, let's, go, let's come back to it. <laughs> there are debates on that. Uh, okay, so maybe C. Is C maybe another one you were looking at? Yeah, so C, also I thought maybe this could be a transistor because of the like interleaving legs. Yes, and I would say that C is, is a good example uh, of a transistor. Okay, very good. So um, is, is the item that I highlighted just one transistor? Or is it a couple of them there? It is one very large transistor. And the way that you know that, well, actually, how, how might you understand whether it's one or two transistors? So the, there is a slight gray box there that kind of like, you know, outlines, yes, that one, that outlines sure, yes. the legs, which I, I believe is the layer that goes through the base and like attaches between the base and collector or base and emitter. Uh, okay, so we should clarify something real quick. So uh, this, and this may not be obvious unless you've looked at a lot of chips. There are several different types of transistors out there. 
namely you'll come out so-called uh, bipolar logic and then you also have say uh, MOS or CMOS logic. Now unless you've looked at a lot of chips you may not be able to recognize the two uh, just by looking at a chip. So I'm going to jump the gun a little bit just to kind of guide things. These are actually MOSFETs. These are not bipolar logic. So there is no there's no emitter, there's no, no base, no collector. Okay. It is a uh, source gate and drain in this case. Okay. But was I correct that that slight gray outline is actually the layer that connects the different parts? Uh, yeah, so that's part of the doping profile. So yes, it's, it's kind of an active important part. I would say that that gray, that, that area, except for where the gate occurs, are going to be the source and the drain of the transistors. Okay. Cool. Um, do we want to jump to another section? Well, let's let's dwell on this a little bit more. So the original question was, how many transistors are in this blue box? Um, mm -hmm. What would dif differentiate one versus two transistors? I guess the number of connections coming into and out of. Sure, that, that's a great metric. How many electrical connections do you see coming in and out of this box? So I see, I guess, one, two, and three maybe? So there's, there's one going to the little bond wire location. Sure, this, this right here, okay. Right. And this kind of interleaves down here. And mm -hmm. goes over here. Okay, great. So that's one. Then there's the darker brown lines coming out on the this, top and bottom. This this right here, yes. Yes. Um, okay. They they go out like there's one that moves horizontally out. Yeah. But but sure. But this is the same electrical here. So let's, mm -hmm. let's call this just uh, one for the purposes of this. So two so far. And the third is at the bottom uh, left hand corner, the great. shiny bright section. Perfect. Okay, so we have another one down here. Now, assuming this was a relatively simple structure, how many connections are there on a transistor? Three. Okay, so we have three wires. So how many transistors would you guess are here then? Just the one? That's right, yeah. This is a power transistor. So what you're seeing here are multiple transistors in parallel. Uh, okay. These right here are the control gates. And so it's essentially three in parallel to form one high power transistor. Okay. Okay, so that's why they have so many legs. That's right, yeah. And this, uh, you call this stuff, is the polysilicon you're looking at here. And it has this kind of reddish color uh, in early chips, which is why if you look in a lot of circuit diagrams like VLSI layouts, it was shown in red, it was because in early microscope images, it kind of had this reddish appearance. Okay, very nice. Okay, I think that's good. Uh, you had another one to look at, right? Uh, yes, D, do you wanna zoom out? Sure. Okay, yes, D is, D is an interesting one. What can you tell me about D? So D, I, I did not know what this is. It look, I mean, I kind of like a transistor. It looks like those little uh, NFC antennas you see on like uh, tags, product tags. <laughs> okay, sure. Um, um, so, yes. Yeah, I I don't know. I mean, I, it it could be like a multi-transistor uh, array as well. I guess well, if you're. Well, let's take what you just learned. What did you just learn that the red bit is? It is a collector. Uh, so that is the polysilicon, mm -hmm. which is kind of a control gate. So they call that the gate. Okay. So that will limit the flow of current from going from one side of the polysilicon to the other. So if you have three of them, they're kind of stacked like this. What's it going to take for current to get from one side? So say this metal here to get to over here. What condition would be required to get the current through all three of these gates? You'd have to raise the the voltage, I guess, if a MOSFET's voltage driven, right? That is correct, yes, they, they are voltage devices. So you'd have to increase the voltage on that? 
on how many of them? Just one of them or all three? I would think all three, right? Because they're gating the flow, isn't it? That, that is correct, yeah. So in order to get power from here to here, if any one of these is off, it's going to gate the, the flow of power. Oh, so is, is that like a, like a AND gate? That's right. You're looking at a three input sort of AND circuitry source. Oh, very cool. Very cool. That, that actually is super cool. Now, I think we're, we're going to jump the gun a little bit with this. But um, uh, you may also be aware, though, that you know, there's different types of circuits. So there's CMOS, there's NMOS. Have you heard those terms before? I have. Do you know kind of the difference between, say, CMOS and NMOS? Not really, but it's, I think it's something to do with the doping layer, right? To some degree, yes. NMOS will have a different doping profile. But at a higher level, what does the C stand for in CMOS? I do not know. It stands for complementary. And the reason why is in a schematic, which I have some that we can uh, go to in a second, um, you have kind of a high driver and a low driver. In say NMOS, what you might do is you might have a pull up or pull down resistor that'll drive current in one direction. Uh, I believe pull up for NMOS. And then when you do uh, a logic function, when you turn on the transistor, the NMOS device will essentially short that uh, current to ground and you lose all the power going through it and you get a, a logic zero on the output. In CMOS, on the other hand, you actually have both an NMOS and a PMOS transistor, which allows you to drive it either high or low. And the main advantage of this is that instead of having resistors that are dissipating power, you have transistors which are more of ideal switches and it's a lot faster to some degree, or at least more power efficient, I should say, more power efficient. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay, so if that is a good starting place, uh, maybe we can uh, kind of go through a tutorial that I wrote a while back on this chip. And I think that that may provide a guided process to help understand these blocks in a little more detail. Does that sound good? Sure, let's do that. Okay, so let me go over here. And, okay, so first thing I had was, if you have this chip, uh, and then we could actually just go over here, I don't think this matters too much. Um, sometimes chip reverse engineering, you know, there's a lot of first principles involved, like knowing, understanding what a, uh, you know, like a, a transistor is, but having a sense of intuition can also help quite a lot, especially in real world problems. So let's, let's take an intuitive approach to solve a few things initially. So first question to you is, what do you think is pin one on this chip and why? Pin one. Okay. And I can bring up this, so I'll give you a hint. It's one of these five. Um, I'd say A because usually pin one's on the corner. Ah, but remember, I have taken this microscope image at a fairly arbitrary angle. Uh, you know, it just happens the text is up right here, but that tends to be a little bit arbitrary. So, so sure, that could be pin one, but that's generally not a good way to guess pin one, unfortunately. Hmm. Maybe C because the incoming trace is pretty big. Okay, sure, you... that's... Uh, but there are also typically multiple power pins. So, you know, for example, I think E is another power pin. So that also has very large traces. So it doesn't help you differentiate. Hmm. Our, then, uh, yeah? Maybe B? Whether, like, maybe the, the surrounding uh, transistors provide protection? No, because there's one below it, for example, which is kind of similar to that. Are there any pads which are specially marked on this chip? I can't tell actually. So we've got five pads here. So let's look at A. A, it's pretty square, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, D, D has a slight cut. That's right. So this I didn't notice that. This doesn't always happen, but you know, designers 
are just, you know, they want to make it easy to work on the chips. So it's actually not too uncommon for them to put some sort of marking so they understand where pin one is. On this particular chip, they've cut the edges, so it's a little bit clear where pin one is. Okay, and let's lead that into question two then. Uh, and let's talk a little bit about power pins on the chip, because this, these are some good fundamentals to start with. So I, I just kind of touched on this a little bit. Can you tell me a little bit, where are the power pins on this die and why? I would think C and E because of the trace sizes. Perfect. That's a great answer. So there's two ways you can approach it. Uh, trace size is the first thing you should look for. Generally, because there's higher currents involved, you want larger traces, just like you'd have thicker wire if you were carrying a lot of current. Aside from that, if you also just look at the extent, like look at, look at how far the wires go on C. You see this going all the way around the chip, right? And mm -hmm. same thing with E. If we trace these wires, you can see my mouse, like this goes all the way throughout the chip. So any sort of nets, you know, wires like that, that, that are very widespread, those are power pins. Now, there's another thing we can do. We kind of look at this, we know it's a sort of a basic logic chip, right? Yep, because of the uh, Sure, yeah, because we've kind of, we see it's not very complex, it's not like a microcontroller where we see, you know, like thousands of transistors or something. Uh, and we kind of know where the power pins are. Now, it turns out that a lot of basic logic chips have fairly standard uh, pinouts. So actually, based on that, we can actually make some interesting guesses. And in fact, we know where pin one is. We know where, uh, you know, one of these is VCC and one VDD, that is plus or minus. Could we actually combine that information to make a guess about what the power pins actually might be? Like if you looked at 7,400 series chips. No, I don't <laughs> know enough. Of, I, I don't know enough of chip uh, okay. to know. Well, where let's, the top let's start with this. How many pins are on this chip? Fourteen. Fourteen, great. Uh, could we find, I think I have a hint here where I have a 14 pin 7400. I think I arbitrarily chose 7400 or something like that. Yeah, here we go. So, so the, just the first one, it just has 14 pins. Um, okay, so we said we know where, where pin one is, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's take this as a hypothesis. If we were to skip one, two, three, four, five, six to seven, uh, we, that might be ground. Right. If this was a if this was a fairly standard 7400 series pinout, it's plausible that pin one to pin seven is a ground. Right. Okay. Now, can you explain the 7400 series relationship to this chip? Like, why 7400? What What's the point of that? Sure. So when I am given a basic, and, and this is actually a common thing I get. This is not a contrived uh, problem. A lot of times I get parts which have been obfuscated by rubbing off markings on the chips, but they're basic logic chips. And I get asked to identify, hey, what is this basic logic chip? And a lot of times it's quicker to just, you know, run that through a tester, but aside from that, um, there is one series of chips which was definitely dominant in the logic design industry for many years. And that is the Texas Instruments, I believe it was originally, uh, 7400 series logic. And, you know, if you were a logic designer and gosh, I don't know, it was the 70s or 80s, you know, this was kind of your bread and butter for designing a computer. Um, and so these were like NAND gates, NOR gates, counters. And to make design a little bit easier, they standardized the pinouts on a lot of these so that power and ground pins tend to be in the same relative positions. And there are some other series like CD4000 that appeared later. But by and large, if you come across an arbitrary basic logic chip, it's very likely it will follow this pin format. Does, okay. that, kind of, does that kind of make yeah. sense? Yeah, that clarifies things. Okay, so if we, if we take this and we go back to this, so we said that this is pin one, right? Mm -hmm. And looking up, because this is just going to be like up like on this chip, maybe I can get these next to each other. Uh, we're going to go counterclockwise around the die. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So pin E is presumably ground if it happens to follow that 7400 series footprint. 
Now, I will also add, if they had a different pin numbering scheme, like maybe ground was pin one, uh, it's likely that it just wouldn't happen to match like this. And in fact, if we keep going around 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, we also see that there's another power pin on 14, which also matches our guess to the right. Does that make sense? Yep. So we can't say for certain, and in fact, with CMOS, to some degree, it almost doesn't matter. But this is, a, this is one way to determine uh, VCC and ground on a simpler chip. Now, on higher speed circuits, there's another way to do it, and it actually may work here too. I haven't looked at it in detail. Uh, PMOS transistors tend to be a little bit slower, so they will make them a little bit larger to, to have them, uh, I guess, a lower, basically higher speed, I guess I should say. Um, but because this is such a basic chip, I'm not sure if they do that matching on here, but that would be another approach on, say, like a, a microprocessor or something like that. So anyways, so this allows us to know that this is VCC up here, and this is gr uh, ground over here. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay. So with that in mind, let's take a look about the next thing I start doing is instead of looking at the actual specifics of what the actual logic is, I start looking at high level flows, like not what the logic function is, but is data flowing from left to right or right to left. And that can, you can get quite a lot about a chip just from starting to look at that sort of high level. So a question is, where are kind of some of the input transistors on this? We talked before about the red polysilicon being kind of the control mechanism on the chips, the gates, right? Yes. So if we could figure out what was driving those control logics, we would know what the inputs were on the chip, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so with that in mind, if we, if we take a look at uh, some of these structures here, what are driving some gates? Like, how do we know what the input stages are? So I think under A, that little block connects to uh, what's listed as B. Yes. The polysilicate there. Mm -hmm. uh, and also C. And also C. OK, yes, that is correct. Um, let me see if I can, yeah, I think, I think that's, that's good. Um, yeah, so we've got B and C, and um, I would say, yeah, so this pin here and this pin are controlling B and C. So pin A and this one here are inputs to B and C. Does, mm -hmm. that, does that make sense? Yep. Okay, so with that in mind, we kind of have an idea of where some of the inputs are flowing through the chip. And I think, uh, yeah, so let me skip ahead. Uh, another high level flow that would be useful. Oh, I thought there were some markings here. Uh, another good thing to do is kind of divide and conquer the chip a little bit. Sometimes you, you tend to look to see like how many different IP blocks are there on the chip? Like, is there a CPU here or RAM here? Do we see any sort of logical way to divide this chip? Like, is there a unit that is maybe repeated multiple times on this chip? You know, are, there, are there areas that could be analyzed in isolation? Do you see any way to divide up this chip into blocks so and houses? Definitely the section on the top right-hand corner seems to mirror the section on the bottom right-hand corner. Perfect. There are three repeated blocks on this chip. So I would suggest instead of going through all three of them, we just kind of focus, laser focus on one, and we take a look at how that works. Sound good? Yep. Okay. And oh, I think I maybe have a little picture of it or something. Yeah. So basically, what you're saying is, you know, it's same circuits repeated. Okay. And then uh, we could look at the input stage in a little more detail, but it turns out that the output stage is a simpler circuit. So I suggest we start with that. And then we can go and take a look at the input stage in a little more detail. Sounds good. Okay, so let's start actually doing a more detailed analysis now on the, uh, the output stage. So 
Uh, I'm calling this N1, so that's net one. And that is an intermediate electrical connection on the chip. I want you to kind of ignore everything to the left of that for now, okay? And don't worry about those transistors, just know that a signal is coming in on N1. And for convenience, I've labeled uh, VDD and VSS, that is you know, positive power and ground. And we've got this output signal on O1. So first of all, just think about this at a high level. If we have one signal coming in and one signal coming out, what are the possible logic operations we could support? Generally speaking, for basic logic. And not. Not, and what is the other one that it possibly could be? Um, it would be the same thing, right? Like Right, yeah, they call that like a, a buffer is common, which you'll hear. Mm -hmm. um, and so, okay, so the next question is, which of those two do we have? So I'm gonna go back to our map since it's, uh, it's a little nicer looking. And let's zoom into, oh, this is your map. Let's do this one. Let's zoom in over here. Just so we get a nicer picture of that. Okay, so we have our control signal coming in over here, right? And we have, these are the control signals we said. First thing to note, how many transistors are, are these, is this control signal uh, driving? Two. Two distinct transistors, perfect. Remember I said that CMOS was complementary MOS? So these are the two complementary transistors. Only one of these two transistors will be on at any one time. In fact, if you were to turn both of those transistors on, it would actually short power and ground and blow up the chip. And that, and that does in fact happen sometimes. Uh, for example, if you're in space, there can be uh, side effects that cause nasty things like that to happen. But under normal circumstances, you should never have one of those on. So do you happen to know uh, what a P PMOS transistor versus an NMOS transistor, kind of what their logic uh, tables are? Like what is zero, you know, does that drive a PMOS or an NMOS? I don't. So typically you have a PMOS transistor uh, connected to the positive power rail and a zero, you know, kind of a low voltage, will switch that transistor on. And an NMOS transistor will be connected to the ground rail and a positive voltage will switch that on. Now we had this uh, label here, I think where I labeled VSS. And so with that in mind, uh, so VDD is positive, VSS is ground. Which of these two transistors, so this one and this one, which one is connected to VSS ground? Uh, the one on the left is VSS. Great. Okay, so this is then the, um, the NMOS transistor. And which of these two then is connected to VDD? The right one. That's right. We can see this going here. Okay, and then the other thing to note, is so if this is where the power is coming in, these two right here, this is where the power is coming out, right? Because they're separated by this control element. So we see power is coming out here. And the same thing, if we look on the left transistor, we see that power is coming out here. So these, the outputs of these two transistors are tied together, right? Yep. Okay, so we have the inputs tied together. We have the outputs tied together. And remember what I said, so a zero coming in is gonna connect the output now to, to the positive uh, voltage signal, right? So mm -hmm. zero volts in, say five volts out, right? And the mm -hmm. same thing for the other side. If we drive five volts in here, that's gonna basically turn on this, um, sorry, turn on this transistor and it's gonna short it to ground here. So you have five volts in, zero volts out. So which logic function is that? It's an OR. Uh, so let's listen again. So it's uh, five volts in gives you zero volts out, and zero oh. volts in gives you five volts out. Uh, that would be a NOT, but didn't you say that either one will be active at one time? So wouldn't, when one is off, the other is on all the time? That's right, because it's actively driven to either zero volts or five volts, um, as opposed to being left freestanding, which would be a high impedance state oftentimes called Z. Okay, so a knot then. It's a knot, that's right. So let's take a look at this now. And I think I've got a few notes here. 
So let's start with a little bit of a schematic. So at the left was what I was calling N1. And then we've got the symbols for, which I've hopefully drawn correctly here. Uh, we have hopefully the PMOS transistor on the top and the NMOS transistor on the bottom. So uh, to give us a little more precisely, so if five volts comes in here, it switches on this transistor here and connects the output to ground. If zero volts comes in here, that is it's grounded, it switches on this transistor here and connects the VCC to the output. So that gives us an inverter functionality. Okay, got it. Yeah, yeah that's the NOT gate. Yeah, and I think I have some quick notes there. Okay, so with that in mind, let's go to the next bit. Let's take a look at the input stage now, which is a little bit more complicated, as you kind of noted. So we've got the same N1 as we had before, except now let's ignore the circuit on the right. We'll come together and piece everything together afterwards, right? So we basically have the same circuit as before, except if you look here, you'll notice these, these three gates here, they all connect to three different input pins, right? So trace them through here, and you'll see that they kind of stack up here in kind of the series configuration. And over here, they stack up in this kind of parallel configuration. So what are some observations on what that logic might be then with kind of all that tying together? So series configuration looks like an AND gate. Okay, sure. And the other one. How, how many input AND gates? Let's start there. Uh, three, it looks like. Sure, so let's talk about that. So, so if this is um, VSS, that is ground. That means that if you take this N1, which is the output net here, if you were to supply all three inputs with five volts in, what would it do to the output? That is, what would it do to N1? It would run at high. Uh, well, VSS is ground. Oh, so it'll yeah, run it low, I guess. Yeah, okay, it'll run it low. Okay, so if all three inputs are high, you'll get a low on the output. What happens if one of these is not high? It, it won't connect this transistor, right? Yep. But what will it do over here? So that's, that's series, you said? So let's take a look. So VDD, so let's, let's just say this is five volts, just arbitrarily. Mm -hmm. So that's going to distribute, say, here and here, right? So it's going along here. And let's take a look at input one. So you see there's a signal connects here. And it goes here. So let's say that you put five volts in on the input, right? So this, this bit is going to conduct right here as a control signal, okay? Okay. Um, uh, I'm sorry, if, if you have a, um, uh, that's how, if you have a zero here, I'm sorry, I misspoke. If you have a zero here, sorry, if you have a zero here, so this is zero volts because this is the PMOS transistor this is going to switch on and it's going to connect your VDD to this net one. Okay. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So anytime you have a zero in on this, it's going to drive this output net one to, uh, to five volts, right? Yep. Okay. And that's going to be the case for any input one, input two, or input three. Cause if we look, they're essentially the same circuit. They've just been interleaved with this five volts. You can see, you know, one of them is here, one of them's here, one of them here, but both of these connect to net one, you know, through here, and the other sides connect to this VDD. So if input one is zero volts, it's going to give five volts on the output. If input two is ever zero volts, it's gonna give five volts on the output. If input three is zero volts, it's gonna give five volts on the output, right? Yep. So we, all, so we always have five volts on the output unless, if all, all of them th are right. So, so that's not an exclusive or, is it? Because not exclusive. It's, it's a three input, what would you call it? Is it an and function? So it's, if any one of them's active, it drives it high. If all of them are active, it drives it low. 
That's right. If all of them are high, it will drive it low. Otherwise, it is high. What is that logic function called? A NAND. That's right. How many input NAND? Three input NAND. Great. So this is a three input NAND gate here. Mm -hmm. OK. So with me so far? OK, we're yes. almost done. OK, so we now know that this is a three input NAND gate. So let's just take a look at that uh, schematically. So just to reiterate again, so we've got our VCC up here. So let's say this is five volts. And that means that if this control signal goes in here, let's say that this is, um, let's say these are all five volts. What's gonna happen is our output signal here, uh, this is what I was calling N1. So if this is five volts, this transistor is gonna be switched on. This is on, this will be switched on, and this one is on. That means that the output signal will be grounded by going through in series all of these transistors to ground. But if all three of these aren't on, let's say that input one is zero, then that means it's gonna switch on this transistor because this is a PMOS transistor as opposed to an NMOS transistor. And that'll connect that to VCC here and we'll drive five volts in on our output. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay, let's piece everything together now. So we know what the input circuitry is and we know what the output is. Like, I don't know if I even really have a diagram here. So if we have a three input NAND, and then we follow that by an inverter, what is the final logic circuit? Not NAND. Not NAND, sure, <laughs> sure, okay. What is, what is uh, it's NAND, NAND not, yeah, not NAND. I'd have to think very carefully. It, is there a specific term for that? Well, let's, let's back up. So if let's talk about it just in terms of truth tables. So mm -hmm. if it's a three input NAND, if you have all three inputs high, you get a low, right? Mm -hmm. So what is the opposite of that? A high. Right. So now, now if you invert it, if all three inputs are high, you get a high, right? Mm -hmm. And otherwise you get a zero, right? Yep. What gate is that? Exclusive or? So uh, if you have all no. three inputs high, yeah. you get a one. So all, yeah. all three high, you get a high. An inverter. Well, an inverter would be if we change the logic state. Like if we got a zero in. No, I, I do not. I don't know the name. I know the logic table in my head, but I don't know the name. Well, maybe we could try writing it out. Um, so if I can maybe get... So let's say, um, yeah, let's say this is input zero, input one, I don't know, uh, input two. So if we have one, 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 let's call this output. So that's gonna be one. And then anything else is gonna be zero, right? So, so that's gonna be zero, you know, anything else. Whatever, whatever I put here is going to be zero, right? Mm -hmm. so, so this is only one if this is one, and this is one, and this is one. Yeah, then it's I a one. forget the term. Well, we said that a NAND gate is a negative AND, right? But we now have- Oh, a it's, it's an AND. That's right. It's a three input AND gate. Three input AND gate. Well, that's a lot of circuitry for a three input AND gate. Right, but you just also learned an important lesson. It is easier in CMOS to design a three input NAND gate than it is to design a three input AND gate. Just the way that the transistors work, it's easier to, divide, uh, to design inversions rather than it is to design basic logic functions. And that's really important. If you look at these designs of things like Cray computers, that's why they were always designed in terms of NAND and NOR gates rather than ands and ors. Okay. And I think if I remember some class correctly, you can design pretty much any logic with a NAND gate, can't you? That's right. And another way to think about it, if you were more comfortable with and and or, we just shown how you can transform a NAND gate into an and gate, right? Mm-hmm. So, and you can imagine that and and or gates can also become anything because that's normally how I think people think about things. So they're roughly equivalent.
Yeah, okay. Very cool. Very cool. You know, th this was this was pretty uh, pretty enlightening. Like it, it uh, you know, I, I would have thought there'd be a whole bunch of little blocks of you know transistors or MOSFETs, and then you'd link them up. But you know, the, the way they have created an AND gate out of you know three of those uh, together is is pretty interesting. I think. Like yeah, and part of the reason why I chose this one also is this is a little bit more of textbook way to lay out these transistors. If you start looking at a lot of basic logic chips, they tend to have these more specialized transistor arrangements. Uh, so just be warned that if you do look at other, even CMOS small chips, they may not be this easy to analyze. Okay. Yeah, you know, I, I did have one question for you. Uh, sure. So, you know, like we have components, we have resistors, we have transistors, we have, um, you know, capacitors, different little discrete components usually, right? Yes. On silicon chips, what are the common type of components you can create on, like, you know, which are commonly created on silicon chips? Transistors, well, obviously. Sure, yeah, so maybe this is a good segue to talk about some of the other uh, things on here. So, um, I these are a little bit less regular on this chip than other chips, so I, I can't speak as authoritatively because some of these are a little bit non-intuitive to me, but let's take a look at this. So we said that this is a power rail here, right? And if we trace around, this is a power rail here, right? Mm -hmm. So one of the major, th oops, me the wrong way. One of the major threats to chips are uh, ESD. So that is if you put a high voltage on uh, a chip pins, there's a very thin electrical connections here that isolate these and the high voltage can arc through those and destroy them. So the way that designers deal with that is so-called ESD diodes that they put on chips. And the idea is that certain high power semiconductors will shunt that power away from the more sensitive, smaller uh, components. And typically you find those, especially I guess on input pins and especially power pins, because those, those also tend to be very long wires. So if we look, we see this structure between VCC and ground, or I should say, uh, yeah, ground and VCC. So I, I can't say for certainty, because this is laid out a little bit differently than I would usually see it, but I believe this is an ESD diode of some sort right here. And okay. um, part of the ways that you get these different structures, uh, take a capacitor, for example. So a gate on a transistor is actually a capacitor by itself. That is, you know, we've got a conductor here, which is floating below a conductive layer uh, below it with a thin oxide in between. And you may remember from physics that, you know, the value of a capacitor is related to the distance between two plates. So if you have two that are very closely spaced together, that will give you some capacitance. So if you just take the same gate that we have here, and instead of making it into a transistor, if you just scale up that gate, so it's a giant gate, that's gonna give you a capacitor on the chip. But there's a problem. That's gonna take up a lot of chip area. So if you need a reasonable size capacitor, they're usually discouraged by, from putting on chips unless you really, really need it. Um, another problem you'll run into are, does that make sense? Yep. Another problem you'll run into are resistors. And there's a bunch of problems with the resistors on ICs. The first thing is that a lot of semiconductor processes, they're fairly precise, but there's still a lot of variation. And so the way that they're typically designed is that all the ratios are consistent, but not necessarily absolute values. And so typically, the way that chips are designed is instead of having say this is a 10 kilo ohm resistor, you would instead design a voltage divider, you know, maybe a 10 kilo ohm and a 20 kilo ohm resistor, which are in series. And that way, if that was 100 and 200 kilo ohms, you'd still get mostly the same output. Because as long as those are the same ratio, you'll still get the same voltage out, roughly speaking. And because of that, you'll see a lot of strange things on ICs. But that also leads us to how do you make resistors on chips? The most common way that I would see for larger chips 
is you'll just take something like polysilicon or maybe um, some uh, active semiconductor like uh, in, um, a diffusion area and you'll have a very long trace, a long thin trace in it. So imagine, for example, this polysilicon gate, instead of being a transistor, imagine they just kind of snaked this back and forth. So that would actually be a relatively significant resistance. The other way that you can do it though, which I think is maybe what we're seeing right here, and this is what you would see in NMOS. And unfortunately, I'm a little bit weak on this side of the analog stuff, so I don't wanna speak authoritatively on this, is if you connect the, um, if you connect kind of the gate to the source of the drain in a specific way, it actually turns it kind of from a transistor into a more of a resistive element. So I think these elements that we're seeing here are either some combination of ESD diodes or maybe pull up, pull down resistors. Because this is roughly speaking what these pull up, pull down resistors look like. Because you see we have, it, it's essentially a transistor because we've got the wells here, we've got polysilicon across, but it's been shorted to either the, um, the source or the drain. And so that usually screams resistor to me of some sort. Right, and it's connected directly to the uh, VCC? That's right, it's connected to VCC. So typically if I see a transistor with either the, uh, the source of the drain connected to a power terminal, so it's been turned from a three terminal device to two terminal device, I usually assume those are resistors. Okay. One, of the, one of the things that confuses me though, and I, I would have to look into this more detail, this has it, I believe, on both. I'd have to, have to double check this, but there's more connections on this net than I would have expected. And so I'm a little bit confused why you have this one and this one, which is what makes me a little bit more hesitant to just claim it's a pull up or pull down resistor. Make sense? Yep, sounds good. I think uh, this was a pretty good uh, introduction to this. I mean, you, obviously this is, you know, an open-ended discussion and maybe in the future we can, you know, pick this up and go a little more complicated. But this was very enlightening. Thanks a lot for this. Yes, yeah, so I uh, hope you all enjoyed and uh, I guess see you next time. Yeah, see you next time. All right. Bye. Bye. And I am going to hit stop in just a moment.